Hello, um, hopefully we're live again. Uh, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit tonight about um, my Happy Reaper pins that I got through the post uh, recently. I think in the last Facebook video I said I was going to talk about them. So, hey, it's Friday night, let's do something cheery, talk about debt, anxiety and nothingness. Uh, yeah, that sounds fun. Uh, I'm in my living room and uh, I've got a different angle. I'm trying different angles to see what looks good. Behind us, you can see that I've got uh, my three-fingered Stalin poster. I'm going to talk about that, I think, in the next Facebook uh, live video that I do. But um, I'll leave it for now in the background and show you the finished product. I, I showed you the pin um, the other week. Uh, but now I've got the backing that the pin was on and I wanted to get the backing before I talked about it. So two seconds. I will just reach over here. <clears throat> and we have my Memento Mori. Uh, Memento Mori uh, is a Latin phrase that um, simply refers to uh, an object that you have that reminds you of your finitude. So it was a big thing in the um, medieval period People would have uh, some object like a skull that would sit on their desk and it was a memento mori. It was a little thing that just reminded them that they were finite, that they were here for a short time. And uh, it's a tradition that I think is quite, quite beautiful. Um, and usually I have a skull somewhere. I usually have a skull ring just as a kind of little reminder of that. So I wanted to create a memento more that reflected some of the work that I'm doing theologically. And I talked to my good friend, um, Clark Orr, who's this great designer um, who's based in Florida, uh, who's worked with Johnny Cupcakes and um, Facebook and various uh, uh, movie studios. And um, he designed this for me. And on the back of the uh, little piece of card, there is a tiny parable and uh, I'm going to read you the parable and then we'll chat about it. Um, the parable is this, you'll, you'll recognize it actually, um, you'll at least recognize part of it. Deep in his slumber one night, a man had a very real yet very surreal dream. He dreamt that he was walking along the beach with death. As he looked up at the sky, he saw all the scenes of his life flash by, along with two sets of footprints, one set for himself and another for death. After all the scenes had flashed before him, he looked back at those footprints and noticed something quite disturbing. At the most difficult times in his life, he saw only one set of footprints. This deeply troubled the man, so he turned and said to death, you said that if I followed you, then you would always walk with me through thick and thin. And looking back, I see that during the most painful times in my life, there is only one set of footprints. Why did you leave me when I needed you the most? I love you and I would never leave. It was during those times when you suffered the most that I carried you. Okay, so if you know the footprints uh, story, uh, you'll of course recognize that I just copied it, but um, replaced the word Jesus with death. <laughs> um, and the question of course is, you know, why? What, what, is this, what does this mean? The idea came to me, interestingly, in a dream. I woke up anyway with this idea in my head. I was uh, thinking about uh, what this, little pin would represent and how best I could describe it. I didn't want to, I was playing around with writing something very straight up about memento mores and the tradition and how death is, 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 is understood symbolically um, in various traditions, etc. Uh, but I much prefer a kind of parabolic type of discourse. <clears throat> and when I woke up, I thought, oh, this would be interesting. Um, so I played with it. And I, I think like any parable, uh, I don't fully know what it means. Like, I don't want to be the, um, the authority on it. 
uh, I, I know what I think about it and I'm going to give you a little bit of an interpretation of it but when I read it I can see that it could be read in, in a number of ways and um, I don't want to limit that. Um, but anyway, let's begin. So death is the name that we give to non-being. It's not the name we give to non-being, we're going to come to that in a second, it is, it is one of the names we give to non-being. In other words, there is being and there's non-being and, and death represents the loss of our beingness. Um, you know, and maybe there's you know, something in the next life, whatever, but in terms of what death means, death means the loss of our being. Right? Um, and a lot of philosophy has been about how do we uh, embrace that or how do we face it or how do we understand it? Uh, you know, death can be an incredibly disturbing reality. And some people have said that our society is partly defined by our fleeing from uh, and denying death, like the psychoanalyst uh, Ernest uh, uh, Bloch. No, it's not, not Ernest Bloch, sorry. Um, who wrote The Denial of Death? I'm sure somebody will put it in the comments, but um, The Denial of Death is about this very idea that, that in our society, we try to avoid a confrontation with our own finitude as much as, as possible. Um, and the results are often destructive. Becker, thank you so much, Alex. I appreciate that. Um, Ernest Becker. Um, so death is a reality, but there are some like the Epic Epic Epicurus, who said, well, you should never really worry about non-being because when you're alive, death hasn't arrived. And when death arrives, you're no longer around. So in other words, never the twain shall meet. And so this kind of Epicurean wisdom is the idea that we shouldn't, we shouldn't get too worried about it. I mean, maybe worry about dying and the pain involved, but death itself, he says, you can have like a stoic attitude towards it. And, you know, that's interesting. There's a lot of philosophy in that. But there was a French existentialist called Gabriel Marcel. Gabriel Marcel was a contemporary of Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, Martin Heidegger. And he's lesser known, uh, but he is, uh, he's quite brilliant. Um, I used to be uh, very interested in his work. And he was a Christian existentialist. And uh, he, one of his jobs was telling families and parents uh, about the death of their children during the First World War. And when he was doing this, he reflected on it as an existentialist. And he, he talks about and he writes about how actually you may be able to come to terms with your own death, but it's, it's almost impossible, perhaps impossible, to come to terms with the death of those that we love. He saw firsthand how devastating it can be for a family to lose someone who they love. I mean, it's devastating to lose um, a parent, uh, but probably so much more so to lose a child because it's so unexpected. And this deeply affected him and he brought it into his work. And he kind of rediscovered how yeah, death, our own death or the death of those we love can really, you know, destabilize us strip away our sense of being in the world, strip away our sense of meaning, rupture the very structure that we live in, rip away all of our desire, you know, creating basically a, a, um, a space in which we find it hard to desire anything at all, whether it's work, whether it's even just watching TV, that somehow this can, can just devastate us in our lives. Um, but death isn't the only name for non-being. The existentialists also talked about how non-being isn't simply that which is at the end of your life and it's not simply that which affects other people. It also is part of us in our very nature and existence. So Jean-Paul Sartre wrote, you know, Being and Nothingness, which explores how nothingness, non-being, uh, is part of being. To be human is to experience lack to experience nothingness. I'm not going to go into details there, but a lot of my work explores this. Um, and, uh, you know, I use the work of people like Paul Tillich, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to explore a theology that takes seriously this non-being. But very concretely, what that means is 
In our daily lives, we can experience lack. So for example, guilt. Guilt is the experience of a lack of being, that we're not living up to something. We have a sense of who we should be and we're not reaching that. So this is guilt. Guilt is a response to a sense of separation from what you feel you should be, what you should feel you should be doing. There is this lack, there is this separation. Also, meaninglessness. Uh, for some people, they experience life as profoundly meaningless. Sometimes it's in small ways, it's that they don't like their jobs. Or sometimes it's in big ways that they feel, you know, a lack of meaning in the universe. And again, that's a lack. To have a lack of meaning is to feel that there's something meaningful that you aren't achieving, you aren't reaching. There's something that if I only got that other job, I'd be happier. Or if I left and became a writer, then I would be happy. Or if I, if I went and, and, and was more involved in my local community, then I would have meaning. So there's a lack, there's a sense in which you're not doing something. Um, and then finally, uh, yeah, death. Death is the ultimate kind of lack. Um, the experience, maybe if you're going through a terminal illness and you're really confronted with your finite amount of time, that you're, you're a being who is approaching non-being. Um, and traditionally, anxiety is the name that we give to this experience, right? Fear is fear of something. Anxiety is fear of nothing. It's fear of nothingness. Anxiety is what arises in us as we are confronted by non-being, by the lack. Now, without complicating the matter too much, um, the psychoanalyst Lacan, uh, he talks about how anxiety, it's not just a lack. It's not just that we experience guilt or shame or meaninglessness or a sense of our impending death and this causes anxiety. Something else has to be in the mix. So what is that? Um, an example would be in economics. In economics, debt, is the name for non-being, for lack. You know, if you, if you owe some money, there's a lack of money. There's, a, there's like a black hole that you have to fill with money. So very concretely, we all know what it is to be in debt. Uh, you can have student debt, you can be in debt because of your house, because of your car. There can be all manner of reasons why you are in debt. But that is a nothingness that makes a demand on your life. Right? Now, that's not necessarily what causes the anxiety. What causes the anxiety are the letters and the phone calls and the emails that remind you of this lack, that tell you you have to fill it. Right? If you've bought houses uh, before the, the recession or you had a home before the recession and it lost all its value and the bank took it back, the bank starts hounding you for the money and that causes the anxiety. Those letters, is somebody going to come around to the house, etc, etc. And... Um, interestingly, in the story of Adam and Eve, you have this. Um, the story of Adam and Eve, which I argue um, is kind of an eatable story. We maybe talk about that another time. But there's at one point where the serpent says, um, if you eat this fruit, then you will be like gods. Now, to be like a god traditionally is to, to have wholeness, to be fullness. God is the being that lacks nothing in kind of traditional symbolic terms. So to be like God is to be without the lack is to be full and complete, to be whole. Eat this and you will be like God, right? Um, that psychoanalytically, that voice that tells you if you do something, you can fill this lack is, is in theological terms, I would say a kind of the demonic voice. So what is the demonic voice in our society? Well, the demonic voice in our society is if you look more beautiful, then you'll be happy. If you have more money, then everything will be great. If only, you know, you did a better job, if you did this or you did that. You know, look how happy everybody else is. You can be like God. You can be whole and complete. If only you do the right yoga practices, do the right prayer practices, go to the right festival, take the right drugs, you know, do whatever it is. It doesn't matter. These can be good things or bad things. In and of itself, it's not, it's not the thing that's important. It's the voice, the voice that's saying, you're lacking, you can be whole. And we have a society where we run from this lack, from this non-being. And we have this voice that's always telling us, you can, you can have it. And that doesn't make us happy, it makes us unhappy. 
Uh, the very voice that says you can have wholeness is the very voice that causes us to want feel anxiety and be depressed. In economic terms, the way out of this is, of course, forgiveness of debt. To forgive a debt is to say the debt means nothing. It's still the, the nothingness isn't paid. The debt isn't paid. The debt is just rendered uh, without sting. It's not. It's not the payment of the debt. It's the forgiveness of the debt. Bankruptcy is probably the closest you have in this system to that. Although I know that in America. If you're bankrupt, you still have to uh, pay your student loans, I think. It's terrible. <laughs> um, so um, the, the idea that I'm exploring in my little memento more is that this is not a grim reaper. This is a happy reaper. You know, we think of the lack as grim, as bad, as terrible. But actually, for someone like Paul Tillich, the challenge, if you want to have the courage to be, the courage to embrace one's existence, one has to make peace with the lack, with non-being, and rob it of its sting. This theologically can be called forgiveness, you know, the forgiveness of a debt where the debt is rendered uh, without sting. It's, it's take, the, 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 the power of the debt is removed, right? That, that, that voice is telling you you always have to be better and do this or do that in order to be, be human. So whenever I wrote uh, this, well, kind of like, you know, obviously, rewrote what already existed. It was to try to capture something of that. To say that, yeah, the, the problem is not non-being. We walk with non-being. Well, non-being walks with us every day of our lives. Every time you feel anxiety, any time you hear that voice in your head, any time that you feel, oh, I need to get married, then I'll be happy, or I need to get divorced, then I'll get married, or I need to have kids, or I need to do this, whatever, wherever you live, whatever the, the, the voices, the society is telling you that you have to to do and be in order to be whole and complete. That, that anxiety will always be with you. You can't fix it by marrying or by getting the word. I mean, those things might be good or they might be bad, it doesn't depend on, but in and of themselves, none of them are gonna to work to get rid of the reaper, non-being. And actually the challenge, the challenge is to make peace with that non-being in our lives, um, to, to get rid of the voice, the serpentine voice, the debt collector, get rid of the debt collector um, and realize that actually, if we're able to face this death, this non-being, we may be able to overcome it in some respects. So that's my little happy reaper pin, that's why I did it. Um, I, I, this is also the subject matter I'm exploring this year. Um, so if you live in LA, I'm doing an event there. I'll be in Grand Rapids. I'm going to Sydney, hopefully in September. I'm potentially going to Minnesota and uh, Rapid City in July. So I'm kind of getting around about a bit and talking about these issues and talking about how we can actually, you know, what this means in practice in our lives. So hopefully you'll be able to join me somewhere um, in my travels. As I say, at the moment, I'll be in Grand Rapids next week talking about this, uh, as well as Parables and Pints and um, in LA at the end of the month. But I've got other things. Or join me for my online Omega course where we'll go into this in, in, in more depth um, as well. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. What was it? I don't know. So I'll just have a quick look to see if there's any questions or thoughts. Um, you know, keep this to about, you know, 30 minutes as always. So I don't bore you too much. It's very depressing talking about death, anxiety and death on a Friday night. But hey, that's life. Um, okay, so... Let's see, any questions? So true death is our undertaker and mother. It messes with us, yes. In fact, I, I'm meeting with um, this woman called um, Caitlin, who's like a big uh, bestseller, writes on death. She has an organization called, I think, The Good Death or something. I've only recently discovered her, but my housemate knows her very well. And uh, we're going we're gonna to meet up this week. And, um, you know, I would love to be able to, you know, work with her in some sort of way. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I would love to do an event with her, um, but we'll see if she's interested or not. But um, I'm looking forward to meeting her. Um, oh, I'd like to know your stance, religious stance in, in uh, STARS, but your stance on suicide, if you don't mind. Wow, that's, oh, that's, that's a huge subject. Um, I don't know, I, 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 I'm reminded of Camus' book, uh, which starts off, the myth of Sisyphus, it starts off in an incredibly jarring way. 
uh, for people who think philosophy is boring, yeah, it often is, sadly, and Western philosophy is often very detached from real existence. But Camus starts that book by saying, uh, the only philosophical question of real interest to us is, is suicide, is whether to take our lives or whether to continue to live. Um, and I remember when I first read that as a teenager, I was really struck by it because the question of, of life um, and the question of death and taking our lives is a very real question for many of us. It's not something to take lightly. It's not something to joke about. It's not something to, um, it's something that plagues many people, um, many people I know. And, um, you know, and of course, even myself, I don't think there's very many people who haven't to some extent contemplated suicide and some people are racked with those. So I, I feel like, you know, if I said anything, it would be inappropriate um, and it would lack, you know, you know, lack the thought that I should give to that subject. So maybe I, I'll kind of come back to that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, powerful question. So sorry, I will, I will, you know, maybe as I say, use this opportunity to, to have a think and to, to read and to talk to people and then come back and, and reflect on that. Um, uh, yeah. So thank you. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Okay, no, we're good. There's not many questions. I don't think we've got that many people tonight. Um, the uh, I, I'm trying to figure out what what's a good time to do these, uh, but because uh, people are coming in from all over the world, I guess it's very hard to kind of pick uh, pick a time that works for everybody. Um, so I will I will sign off. Um, but thank you for for joining me for these these very somber uh, reflections. If you want to know more as well, the book The Courage to Be by by Paul Tillich is very good. Um, Paul Tillich's theology kind of starts with this idea that that non-being is something that we have to wrestle with and work with and do something with. And uh, so. And, and so it is my work. That's what I use the term original sin for. I don't use it in the traditional religious or metaphysical sense. I just mean it as there is an original lack, original sense of non-being that is part of being human. And um, it's something that we need to, to wrestle with and uh, you know, ultimately find freedom and liberation from. So there you go. I'm hoping to be able to, to you know, sell these at some point um, I've got a friend who's setting up an online store for me and a funny story is he set it up and he turned it on for five minutes to see if it would work and somebody was able to go in and buy one of these. So now I have to go down to USPS tomorrow and post it off to them. But um, if you come and hear me speak, I give these out often where I speak um, for my day events or you can buy them, whatever. So, um, But sadly, you're going to have to find me if you want your little death. And there you go. And I don't mean anything sexual by that. Little death and, you know, what the French say. Okay, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Whatever you're doing tonight, whether it's reading, going out, watching a movie, hanging out with friends, I hope you enjoy it. I'll talk to you again, hopefully at the weekend. Bye.